Good afternoon, everyone. We're just going to give everybody a few moments while we go ahead and get started. Well, everyone's joining before we get started with today. If you're just joining us, we're going to get started in just a few moments. We're just going to give everybody a chance to sign on. All right. While people are still joining on, I'll just go ahead and get started with introductions because I'm so excited for today's program and I know if you're like me, you don't want to miss it. So um, I just want to say good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Hudson Library and Historical Society's author series. Today, we are so honored to have best-selling and award-winning author Philip Gregory join us to discuss her latest book, Normal Women, 900 Years of 900 years of making history. She'll be joined in conversation today with Rachel Carmel. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone to please check out all of our exciting upcoming programs at hudsonlibrary.org. We have so many great both virtual and in-person programs coming up. I don't want you to miss it. You can purchase copies of Normal Women available from our local independent bookstore, The Learned Owl, and I will be including the link to purchase the book in the chat as soon as possible. Um, at any point during the event, you can ask questions. Please leave them in the Q&A section, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Now, let me introduce our first speaker. Rachel Colonel is the Dean of Mandel Honors College and Mandel Chair in Humanities. She's been a professor in the English Department at Cleveland State University since 1994, teaching courses in 18th and 19th century British literature. Dr. Colonel is an author, uh, an editor of five of five scholarly books on 18th century literature and political history, including Backlash, libel, libel, Impeachment, and Population in the Reign of Queen Anne. She received her undergraduate degree in French from Harvard College and her master's and PhD in English from Boston University. Philippe Gregory is one of the world's most former Foremost historical novelist, she wrote her first novel ever, Whiteacre, while completing her PhD in 18th century literature. It sold worldwide and heralded a new era of historical fiction. Um, her flair for blending history and imagination developed into a signature style, and she went on to write many best-selling novels, including The Other Bullen Girl and The White Queen. She is a recognized author authority on women's history and graduated from the University of Sussex and received a PhD from the University of Edinburgh. Um, in 2020, she was made a commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire <laughs> in the Queen's Birthday Honors for her services to literature and charity. She was a member of the Authors uh, Society of Authors and in 2016 was presented with the Outstanding Contribution to Historical Fiction Award by the Historical Writers Association. Um, I just want to thank you both so much for being here today. It's an honor to have you join us. Thank, thank you. you. Great to be here. Yeah, yeah, and do, uh, it is an honor. It's a terrific honor to to it, it speak with you today, Philippa. Um, and I'll just start at the beginning with the question about the title, um, "Normal Women." And yet, I saw a book review where it sort of referred to your treatment of ordinary women, and then that made me think: Did you consciously choose between a term like "ordinary woman" women and then "normal women," which you ended up with? With with, with what was your thought on that? No, it was it was a very considered choice. I mean, I think that uh, my entire drive was to not do a book about the well-known women that we know already because uh, they're very well researched, they're very well written, and also there's relatively few of them. And that when we look at you know twenty great women in history or ten wonderful women or even more provocative. 10 badass women, you start thinking, are there really only 10? Are there really only 20? And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to give the impression that there were 
as there were millions of women who uh, don't enter the historical record, but there really should be uh, historically recorded, and their lives are completely normal, that their heroism and their courage and their exceptionality is normal for women. They're not ordinary women at all. They uh, are in ordinary settings, uh, and they are in a country which is ordinary for its time, but their, and their lives are normal for the time that they live in and normal for them. But what you see when you look at them is that they are extraordinary. So I wanted to really introduce this idea of being normal, but not being at all banal. That That's terrific, yes. That, that's just, I was thinking it must have been something along those lines. And that's, that's it was really, along those lines. Yeah, and also really. a, a, a title which was Banal Women of History <laughs> would, you know, not really be very attractive. <laughs> So in, in at the end of the introduction, you include this fantastic photo of a woman you describe as a normal woman, Elaine Wed, around 20 years old, member of the first day nursing yeomanry, um, and your mother. Do, would you give us any more information about that terrific photo and your, your, your mother, who sounds remarkable? Well, my mother was among the many, many women who uh, were called up in the Second World War. Um, she was among the many, many women who had the sense to volunteer before the call up came so she could get into uh, a good service. She got into the FANY, which is where the Queen served, and it was notorious for, well, famous, probably not notorious. It was famous for being where the elite women went. Uh, for instance, when it was first formed at the First World War, you could only join if you had your own horse. So it gives you an idea <laughs> of the sort of uh, recruit they were expecting. And uh, in the Second World War, uh, ambulance women drivers were allowed to, in the fannies, in the FANYs, were allowed to wear their fur coats over their uniform for warmth. So it's a, it's a, it's a fancy regiment. Um, and my mother joined it because she was of the uh, country aristocracy. And uh, she uh, served, you know, all, always in England. Uh, this was before women could ever serve in a fighting service. And she served throughout the war in the Fannies. And um, she, I think for me, typifies the, the concept of a woman whose life is in her mind, completely ordinary. But if you look at it with a historian's eye and a historian who is interested in individual achievement, it's a heroic life. So she never got any medals except the Medal of Serving during the war. She never got any titles or any awards or anything. She would never have expected anything. She thought her life was, uh, she probably thought her life was quite dull. She certainly knew it was normal, but it includes in it times of extraordinary courage and events of both very, very funny, very, very tragic, a normal life, well lived. And uh, she, in that sense, she's very typical of the women that I write about throughout the entire book uh, in their different historical periods. Oh, yes, thank you. I was, I really was wondering about her when I saw that photo. Um, and now I'm thinking about this, your choice to write this big sweeping history. I once heard a talk by the Harvard historian, Jill Lepore, and she said that growing up, she loved big sweeping American history books, but of course she wanted to write a very different one. And so I'm wondering, and I think about Jane Austen, you know, avidly reading Goldsmith's History of England, but then writing snarky notes in the comments, you know, in the March instrumentary perspective. And I'm wondering, were there historians you absolutely loved growing up, even though you were frustrated that they were leaving out all this, all, all these other, all these women from history? I don't think I read history growing up very much. Uh, the the book that I remember that actually I still have is a children's history of Great Britain. And that was literally great men with, uh, I think, Florence Nightingale, Queen Elizabeth and Boadicea, which is your absolutely typical, hardcore, great women. And I don't think it troubled me then as a girl at all. But uh, when I came to study history uh, at uh, the University of Sussex, I was absolutely blown away by uh, the work of the English uh, historians of the 1950s, people like E.P. Thompson, who wrote a mm -hmm. huge sweeping history, which you all know, of course, the making of the English working class, which is radical in its intent, in that what it does is bring together lots and lots of 
histories and lots and lots of original sources about men who did not enter the historical record at that time. The men who formed together first in um, small informal groups, in guilds, in, in what they called corresponding societies, and then ultimately into unions. And that in a sense, their joining together made them understand that they were actually a class, they were the working class. Um, and they, they didn't have any no, notion of a sort of possibility of collective endeavor or of the importance that they were to the nation. And in many ways, that sort of early working class consciousness is very, very much like women. Very, very late in the 1950s, I don't think that women as a sex had any idea of the fact that they might have a coherent, shared viewpoint or interest or position, and that they might use that to go towards change, that they might invent, for instance, a concept like sisterhood, which meant that there were things that you felt almost obliged to defend and support, even up to the modern world today. Yeah, yeah thank you. That's really helpful. And now I really want to get back into your career as a writer, both as a novelist and as a historian. Um, and I was just struck having myself once done a PhD in 18th century British literature. Um, I think a lot of us, or a few of us might have thought, oh yeah, one day I might write an historical novel. Most of us never did. <laughs> and you actually did it while still a student. And then it was a, a terrific bestseller. Um, how did you pull that off? <laughs> did you <laughs> manage to write a novel like that while also a student or, or wherever you were in your academic trajectory? I, I was in so an insane period of my life. I, I had just had my uh, first child. I was completing my PhD and uh, you would think I would have no time at all. And actually, I think that I used my novel. It was my first novel was called Wideacre. And I think I used it like lots of people use fiction to read that I had this very, very, of course, demanding day schedule, which was with a new baby. And I had this uh, very demanding sort of year schedule, which was within two years, I really had to finish my PhD, or I would run out of funding apart from everything else. And, um, and you know, and a husband and a home and an, and an ordinary life. And uh, I just used to allow myself in my coffee break, uh, from my writing my PhD and in the evening when I would otherwise be watching television say I used to allow myself to go and write my novel and I wrote it longhand because I couldn't have the rattle of a typewriter um, when I was sitting on the sofa with my husband apparently watching television but actually writing my novel but that's because writing is such a joy to me it's it's never a chore and it was easy it was easy to do and it was the, the thing I wanted to do most. Do oh, tell I, me before we, before we go terrific. on to me. What was your title? What was your PhD on? It, the Political History of the British Novel. Um, the, the, the book it became is Partisan Politics, um, Narrative Realism in the Rise of the British Novel, some sweeping history. <laughs> so, oh, lovely. Yeah, lovely. So. I got very, very interested in the complete blocking out of the experience of the rural working class. From the novels mm. that, that there's this mm. real drive you will have seen it yourself there's this real drive to imagine a sort of medieval romantic pretty past at the very time that the people who are writing and reading the novels are driving working people from the land and i thought mm -hmm. the novel is so interesting in how it reveals people's obsessions and reveals their desire to conceal them as well and how the novel scripts what we take as normal humanity. So I think it's yes, also very connected. I mean, yeah. the way you're 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 thinking about the history of novels and writing novels and writing history is all obviously very inter interconnected. I had um, to promise myself not to put quotations from the novel into normal women because I wanted it to be verifiable history. So although people's diaries are, of course, partly self-fictionalized. I would use a diary, but what I wouldn't use was Clarissa, for instance, or Pamela, mm -hmm. or some of the great 18th century novels, which give you such a clear picture of what people thought women were like at a time when they were clearly not like that. So yes. I would read, I would, I do use Mary Wollstonecraft's uh, historical material and her mm -hmm. uh, journalism material, but mm -hmm. I wouldn't use her novel. Fantastic, right. Um, 
And now I want to think a little bit about the writing process. I, I'm really thrilled to hear that you were sitting there writing long <laughs> with a dissertation to do a baby I'll spend on television on, and that you found it easy. So again, I am in, you know, in awe here. <laughs> but um, I was I saw something, I picked up a copy when I saw that you mentioned in your afterward that you had this or your introduction that you had this idea for writing this sweeping history of women at the time that you were writing. Um, the other Berlin girl, I went, you know, fetched a copy and started rereading it. Um, and um, and then I noticed at the back of this paperback edition, it had this nice interview with you. I don't know when it was done, but in one piece of the interview, someone asked you a question about your writing process. And you give this wonderful answer where you describe sometimes making an enormous chart, you stick on the wall with all the dates and maybe even transparencies. And then you map your characters geogra you know geographical and chronological movements through as the royal court moved from place to place do, do you still do that with all that fantastic preparation and, and and do you do that both for history and for novels or what's your current process i didn't do it for the history because there was because the history there's so much material so i mm -hmm. i wrote the history in a rather, and it doesn't have to be inspired in a way. I wrote the history in a more, more conventional way of taking tons of notes and filing them in an enormous, <laughs> I mean, it sounds so pedestrian, but literally like you'd, like you'd do any sort of research work. So just lots and lots of notes and filing lots and lots of notes and then trying to write something with them to hand, but not transposed. I mean, always going from the notes to what you think about the notes, which is why something's authored and why it's not, why you shouldn't just go back to your source material. But I wish I could turn the camera around because you would see my room is is covered with, uh, it's like a student's bedroom with stuck up posters. And at the moment, I haven't taken down from the last novel. So I've got um, London in 1660 all around the room and maps. So how do you get from London, from one side of London to another? And uh, lots and lots of illustrations about uh, ordinary life, because that's the sort of thing that it's helpful just to have in your, almost in your sort of peripheral vision, just to remember that you're not in the modern world, that you're there when you're writing a historical novel, which is very different from writing a, a history when you know you're in the modern world and you're trying to explain how we got here from there. It's a very, very different sort of consciousness. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 wonderful. Uh, yeah, I would like to see the other side of the room now. <laughs> um, so, so now I have a question about um, what, what most of us were taught at school. And I've heard you sort of refer to this, at, you know, in a podcast. Um, we all know 1066, um, William the Conqueror. We, many of us have read about enclosures and how that affected this, that, and the other. I think most of us wouldn't have known unless we'd read your book that William the Conqueror had all kinds of effects on England, but actually it was also, you know, it was troubling for the position and the rights of women that enclosures also uh, greatly affected women that a lot of the riots, in, including, you know, uprisings like that became the Peterloo Massacre were uh, places where women were targeted. And I'm wondering, when did you become aware of all these details about how the effect on women was so different than anything we were taught when we were taught history at school? I mean, th this is, it's it's one of the benefits of doing genuine research. So I knew I wanted to write about the role that the women had played in society from 1066 up to the present day. I wasn't sure what my stop point would be. Um, but only when I started to look in detail, for instance, at the Bayeux Tapestry, that you see that this is an invasion of a country and there are only five women depicted on the Bayeux Tapestry. Um, hundreds of men, hundreds of horses, dogs, birds, cats, um, incidences of uh, destruction of property, uh, soldiers dying, but only five women and of them, four of them are being assaulted or sexually assaulted. And one of them is being touched, it looks like, without her consent. And it's when you look at the detail of that, you go like, how extraordinary that there is there are no depictions of women fighting, though we know women fought. There are no depictions of the women fleeing from William the Conqueror's reign. Hundreds of them went into nunneries in order to avoid forced marriages to Norman lords. There's no acknowledgement of uh, the women who resisted 
uh, William the Conqueror, though we know that, for instance, th there was a siege of London, which is hardly ever written about because it was women and old men defending uh, uh, a city on the brink of ruin. So I, I didn't know how important what I call doomsday, I mean, they called it doomsday later, but not very much later, what doomsday meant specifically to women of England until you start looking at what is the price of the invasion and the biggest and most obvious price of the invasion to the English people is that William of Normandy brings in feudalism, which gives you a pyramidical social structure with the king at the very top, with lords under him, with uh, yeomen under him, with peasants under him, with serfs under him, with slaves at the very bottom. But at the bottom of every layer is the man's woman because she has no rights at all. So you end up with this uh, pyramid structure in which every other layer is actually invisible because it hasn't been thought worth worthy of note to remark that a lord's wife, the lady, has no rights, no status. The minute she marries him, he has all the wealth that she may have had before and that he has an automatic right to her body any time he wants because the assumption is that on her wedding day when she promises to uh, be his wife she hands over all rights to her body and that when she promises obedience he is then legally allowed to beat her into obedience. So it's an extraordinary attack upon the women who as women under the Anglo-Saxon rule uh, had been landowners, had been capable of setting their own contracts for marriage, had been people who owned money, who paid their own taxes, who owned their own lands, who owned their own wealth, and who could divorce if they wanted to. Yeah, no, um, it, it, it's it's absolutely sort of, you know, revelatory. Everything you sort of think, you think you know history, and then, well, wait, I didn't know this, I didn't know this, I didn't know this. Um, and, and I have, before we get into the audience Q&A, and I'm sort of going to encourage, encourage audience members to put putting their questions into the chat, um, I've got a, just a few more questions to sort of round it out. And I'm, is the history you write, is it depressing or is it uplifting? Because I, I was trying to consider that because on the one hand, I, I kept on thinking, oh, things got worse after 1066. Oh, things got worse after, you know, 1660. Oh, things got worse after, in, you know, in the Victorian era. And then, of course, you have things got worse, but then people push back. Yes, there were the suffragettes. Yes, there was this. Yes, there was that. Um, do you feel depressed or uplifted by the sweep of history you narrated for us? I think whether you feel depressed or uplifted depends very, very much on whether you're prone to depression or optimism. And I am fatally prone to optimism. I always think it's going to come out all right. And I think you would have to be optimistic or you wouldn't start a history of England in 1066 and plan to finish it 900 years later. You'd have to have a sort of sunny little approach to life to assume that you could do it at all or that you would do it before you died. <laughs> so there's that. But also to me, what I read in the history was not just the appalling oppression of women and the appalling abuse that individual women and collectively women suffer, but also that absolute resilience, that absolute defiance that every generation you get an advance and, and every advance gets a pushback and then you get another advance. And I'm inspired and encouraged by the history of women because what I think it shows on the one hand is that the fact that we don't have equal pay is now, I mean, the last time we had equal pay in England, men and women, was 1349, which is outrageous. And between then and now, we've actually had laws passed to say what jobs must be paid equally. And we still have uh, women earn about three quarters of the male pay. And of course, all the domestic and caring work and and uh, cooking and cleaning that women do in their homes is completely unpaid and indeed unrecognised, even in the calculations of gross domestic product. So what, what I learned from that is firstly that the things that work against women are not an accident. They come in by law, they are enforced by law. And when you move the law or change the law, 
then they come in by the back door. There's a continual pressure upon women's rights and women's lives and women's opportunities by men who would not be as rich or successful if they had to compete on an even playing field with women. That is why it is how it is. But against that, every generation, you have these women who are so brilliant and so inspired and so inspiring that they get to the tops of their professions, that they challenge the laws, that they sometimes have the uh, sense of sisterhood and decency to bring other women up with them. And that's when you see genuine change. And that to me is like not depressing, but incredibly inspiring and incredibly exciting. Good. I, I'm really glad to hear that, that take on it. And it, it sort of brings me to something you say in the afterword, which is that you, this book, this whole sweep of history, uh, which actually is a little more optimistic than, than perhaps one might think, um, is neither a condemnation of the past nor a call to action. And so you say that, um, um, but then you also say um, 10 pages later in the afterward um, that if you know if you write history without writing about women, you lose sight of real women and also lose sight of what a woman might do. So I guess I want to juxtapose those two sentences within you know 15 pages of them, them each other in the afterward and think, um, I sort of do see the book, if not as a call to action, then something that inspires us to keep in sight what a woman might do. So in that sense, if it's not a call to action, is is it yet an inspiration? I mean, I felt very inspired by it, um, even if perhaps not exactly called to act, but I, I sort of was called to act, I felt, or am somehow. I mean, I think, firstly, you're obviously a great tutor at your university, because that's literally, you have nailed why I say one thing and 10 pages later, I say something that looks a little bit like the opposite. I'm gonna work on that. And the way I would work on it, if I was talking to you as my tutor, the way I would try and slide it past you is to say, it's not a call to action in the way that I really can't stand um, books which pretend to be a history of women saying, now you must go out and do that. Now you must do this. Now you must be this sort of person. It's not. It's supposed to be a really genuine history of women of the past. It's not telling women of the present what to do. It's not telling women of the future what they, what they should turn into. In any way that it is a call to action, it's a model for historians as how to do history. Now, We'll have to keep that between ourselves and between our audience because I don't want loads of historians telling me that I can't tell them how to do history. But what I would say is if you write a history without 50% of the population in it, you can't call it a history of England. You can call it a history of men's England. And that's what so many of the history books on my shelf should be called. It, they should be called, I mean, I'm just looking over and there's things like um, Winston Churchill's History of the English Speaking People. It isn't the history of English speaking men. And what I what I like the book to do, it's not a call to action, but it is an example of how we should be writing history if we want to call it history. If we want to call it a completely slanted, biased view of some of the people of the country who are the ones who are lucky enough to be at the top of the top of the top pile, carry on as you're doing. But in that sense, it's not a demand that anybody should do anything except I, what I hope they would do is read the book, reflect on it, and maybe at the outside, that is not a call to action. See that unless women work for each other, we won't ever get anywhere because that's the lesson of the book, that it's the collective action when women don't just look at their own individual survival or their own individual profit or their own individual progress, but they actually look at other women. That's when we find improvements in the quality of everyone's lives. That, that's terrific. Yes, I, I really I really like that um, as, as a summing up, um, both advice to historians, but also again, that each of us can feel that inspiration. I, I feel inspired by what your mother did and by all these individual narratives of women uh, in every era who pushed back. Um, and I just, I just want to throw out there that I see there are four or five questions in the chat, which I'm going to start turning to now. So for anyone in the audience who wants to start adding yours, this is a great time to do it. Um, I also had at least one question, a former MA student of mine emailed in 
uh, yesterday, um, she had actually done her MA thesis on historical fiction and touched on various novels, including you. Um, but she was wondering, as you're writing, uh, do, do you sometimes get a, a sort of a personal attachment to some of your characters more than others? And I think she meant either in the novels or in some of these many anecdotes of history. Are there characters or figures in history you've really identified with as you write? I mean, the novels very much so, because with the novels, I, I, of course, I select someone to write about because I think they're going to be of interest to me. And uh, all of the novels that I have written so far have been about um, ex all of the historical biography type novels have been about women who, in the main, there's quite a lot of material on them. Uh, the other Bolin girl, Mary Bolin, there was almost nothing on her but uh, you can trace her her movement around England and her life because it's quite often reflected in uh, the records of the court, which are fundamentally concentrating on the Queen, then her sister. But so you can find her uh, a lot of the time. Uh, so I do get the, the, the fictional biographies I get deeply attached to. I'm working on them for maybe a year, maybe two years. And um, when I finish... I, I have a genuine sense of loss that I'm not going to be in their world, trying to walk in their shoes every morning. It's it's extraordinary. It's it's a real wrench when I finish this. Uh, the history, normal women, a little bit less so because there's so many women. So and and this long historical sweep. So I I have a a great affection and respect for some of them, but you. I just get a little glimpse of their lives or or I get the report at their trial or something somebody says about them. So it's never that sort of big biography. There's one, uh, and she's the woman on the front cover, who's Mary Edwards, who's an 18th century uh, wife. So literally uh, in the period of Jane Austen. So we think we know what an 18th century wife is like, and she is not like that at all. So she is married to a man who she marries for love. She's said to be the richest woman in England. She's a fantastically wealthy heiress. And she marries, unfortunately, a handsome guardsman who turns out, as they so often do, to be a wrong un. And uh, he takes her money and he starts spending her money. And uh, she literally has no redress as a married woman in the 18th century. All that she owns is his. If he chooses to spend it on gambling, it's absolutely up to them. They have a son together. So if she were to leave him, she would leave without her money and she would leave without her son as a wife. So she's in the absolute classic bind of the dependent woman in a patriarchal society. And uh, what she does is she just says that she never married him at all. And if she had a marriage license, she has the good sense to tear it up or burn it. And uh, she declares herself a spinster. And so she declares her son a bastard. And she risks, of course, complete social ostracism. And it's such, such a bold move. It really is. And um, she wins. She just wins outright. He doesn't declare that they were married. He says nothing about it. He goes off and tries to marry another heiress. And she lives the rest of her life as a single woman, doesn't suffer, as far as I can see, any great social shame. And uh, she has her son and he inherits her two, we know of two beautiful properties, one in central London, one in the lovely rural village of Islington, which if you know England at all, is now a, a, a part of central London. Um, and she has enormous properties all around the world and she dies a wealthy woman. And from the look of the portrait, she dies a happy woman as well. So she really bucks the trend and I can't help but love her. That That's terrific. Um, in fact, one of the uh, audience questions was, do you have a favorite story that you uncovered? So I, that, that's that, that <laughs> terrific. Would be her, yeah. That's a that terrific would be story. And I, and I think also, again, not the story of any woman that Jane Austen narrates. Um, no, no, uh, no, but I mean, no, that's, no. that's what's but, so wonderful about looking at history and not at fiction, um, mm -hmm. that the history is almost always wilder and more exceptional and and more surprising than the fiction because women get into history for uh often doing something wrong 
uh, or doing something extraordinarily heroic and certainly out of their perceived character. But women getting, you know, women heroines in the novel tend to be right along the stereotype of, of acceptable behaviour because that's how people read novels. That's what people want in novels. But real women are actually much, much more interesting. Yes. That's terrific. Uh, now, one reader asks a question about the resources you relied on when writing this book, um, you know, because it's so actually, as this reader describes it, it's encyclopedic in, in, in your coverage. Um, and this reader is both interested in what were your resources? And I was actually also interested in that, you know, how do you go into archives, you know, how? How do you uncover all of this? Um, and then, and then um, the reader, the, uh, the the listener also asks, were there any aspects that you didn't include? I mean, this is this is actually a, a pretty long book. But <laughs> there, there must have been things you left out too, as well. So yeah, that, that's um, sort of the... yeah. I'll, I'll take that first. I mean, of course, there are there's a lot I didn't include. I was very very happy to drop as much known history as as would leave the book coherent in terms of we are moving from one era to another. But I didn't uh, I didn't do the timings in terms of the reigns of kings. And if I could avoid naming a king or avoid naming a man, I did. So it was ah. completely uh, vindictive at some levels. I think enough, some many, many men have had enough fame. They don't need me to put their name in the book. So uh, all that's a lot of the so-called male history I don't write about. So I don't explain what the Crusades are. I don't explain mm -hmm. what the plague is. I do spend quite a lot of time on witchcraft because that's so core to the female experience that although it's well known, I thought it had to be in. I don't spend a lot of time on Emily Pankhurst as a great, great suffragette because you know about Emily Pankhurst and if you don't, it's easy to look her up. But I do spend a lot of time on the anti-suffragettes who were the women who didn't want the vote and who had an extremely coherent and wildly popular campaign to, to not give women the vote. And that was initially women demanding that they were not given the vote because they said they didn't have the experience or the expertise or the education to run an empire. And you go like, how extraordinary, how alien to us as feminist historians who think that women's statements must always be to take power, to move into authority, that here should be these highly educated, highly intelligent, very active, politically active women who didn't want women to have the vote. They didn't want it for themselves. They, th they thought that they would work best at the local level and by influence. So I had to leave out, I had to leave out for time a lot of things. I probably left out a lot of theological history and a lot of church history which is a bit of a miss, but it's not of great interest to the modern reader. And a lot of the stuff was, in a sense, a cul-de-sac. So a lot of the um, problems for women around the period of the Reformation, I really tried to acknowledge, but acknowledge more in terms of their the problem for them as women with a changing church than go into the politics of the changing church. So that was the missing out stuff. And the the stuff I used, how I got to all of this information, was delightfully simple, really. It was just reading loads and loads and loads of mostly secondary sources. So oh. there are wonderful medieval historians who have done wonderful original research. And their books are available. A lot of their books are available as e-books. You could just, you know, you could go to my book list at the end, pull up these books and read them. And... Uh, what was what is different about my book is that I've taken all of these specialist books from these different periods of time and tried to string them together into a coherent story of women's development over time. And what is what I bring to them that they don't do because they don't want to do it. So a medieval historian wants to talk about medieval women. And some of the books are fantastically good, uh, you know, Early modern historian wants to talk about early modern women. And again, their work is fantastic. What you won't find outside of my book yet, though I hope there will be more, is a book that, that looks at medieval women's experience and the early modern experience and looks at how we got there, one from the other, because it's the idea of progress or lack of progress. It's the journey. 
that I'm really interested in the journey through time. And therefore, I could research that with uh, published histories, mostly published histories all the way through. Right. And when you mention that, um, and if you look at for the readers, if, when you get to the select bibliography that she's referring to at the end, I'm just scanning down the dates of those publications. And I'm realizing, again, a lot of those would have been written in the last 30 or 40 years. And that kind of, because this was the era when people, historians were starting to write women's history. Is that right? Absolutely. Before 1950, yeah. uh, there's hardly anything written about women's history. And I had I have a podcast series called Normal Women. And the first podcast I did, I invited on as a guest Sheila Rowbottom, who is the great pioneer historian of women's history. And you know, she is she is still writing. So in a sense, the women's history is a very, very new branch of history. It started pretty well in the 1950s as people realized that the history of working people had not been told. And then when that started to be addressed, they realized that working women don't appear in those histories necessarily. So that's, it's literally, it's a new form of history. It's its fascinating to be part of it. It is, and, and I, I really appreciate your sort of bringing it all together for us and just giving us this, 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 you know, cumulative sweep of it. It's, it's really very satisfying. Um, now, one of the uh, viewers is also asking about what this person describes as historical oppression is it as simple as power and control and i don't know whether this viewer is thinking of you know one step forward two steps back or that constant you know pushing and, and pulling um what would you like to say about this question about power and control um i think it is absolutely about power and i mean that's why it's so striking that it comes in with an invading army so the aristocracy of England after 1066 is all Norman and the invading army is almost all male. So the, the class that come in are all men and they come in and they take over all of the principal uh, lands of England. There's about a quarter of the land is reserved for the church, but of course that is itself headed up by a male. There are female church institutions, but they're not nearly as wealthy or as well endowed or as big as the male ones. Um, and they pass out of the control of women at the time of the Reformation anyway, when you have an entirely all-male church. So it is about power. It starts with a military power, with a military takeover of England. And then because they bring in feudalism, that's a, a system of government and a system of uh, control of the land, which absolutely defines uh, patrilinear inheritance. So the rule of feudalism is it goes from the Lord to his son, or if he doesn't have a son, to the most distant man, however idiotic, however incompetent, however far from the family, doesn't matter. And we were talking about Jane Austen earlier. So many of the Jane Austen stories are about this problem of a male heir coming in to take the property away from the daughters of the recently deceased man. There's, I can think off the top of my head of three novels which are almost exclusively about that problem. And people saw it as late as the 18th century as a problem, but it's only in my lifetime that we've changed the rules that uh, a, a woman can inherit, that the oldest child inherits, whether female or male. We haven't even changed that for the titles. We've changed that for the lands, but a lot of the lands are connected to the title in England. Mm -hmm. So it is about power. Um, it starts with a military power, which transmutes itself into a political power. And then thereafter, it is about controlling the people who rebel against it. And what you see really, really clearly is how if there's an effective rebellion, then the people, the men who are in the power buy off. So the suffragettes, which we traditionally hail as a, as a complete triumph for women's collective power, the suffragettes are bought off. The first women that get the vote are women who own property in their own name, which means in the 1918, hardly anybody and all of them elite they're the very 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 few wealthy women who happen to own, own property in their own name so they're probably either single or widows so it's a tiny tiny fraction and the suffragettes settle for that and call that victory and that in a sense tells you everything about how 
power it is invested and then control follows yes yes that's a thank you that's very clarifying and as a follow-up to that i see another question which um would follow nicely there someone else asks who are women we know now in history that we should admire because they are pulling other women up by their action in their lives uh well i hope that you have a normal heroine in your own life i mean i hope that your mother raised you and pulled you up and that your her, your grandmother pulled her up in a sense that's why i like to focus on normal women and not on the the well-known women of history because we all have to do it. It's normal. It is normal and right to bring other women into your success if you have success, and also normal and right to ask other women for help. That it's, it's a two-way street, it always is. In terms of who promotes and assists women, I, I don't know enough about American history to recommend anybody to you. I know enough about English history to say few and far between, even now, uh, so Margaret Thatcher, um, our first female prime minister, promoted no women into mm -hmm. government and had only in her entire long political life two women in her cabinet. And the legislation that she passed was very detrimental to the lives of ordinary normal women um, further down the social scale and poorer women. So it's it's something it's something that I think that we have a not it's are you attempting me into a call to action i'm not going to make a call to action but when we look at women politicians when we look at women leaders i think it is absolutely reasonable to say to ourselves looking at them that's great i'm glad we've got a woman prime minister but what work is she going to do to promote women in her own sphere and to assist women outside her sphere yeah Thank you. Um, and I wanted the two other interesting questions. One is about, well, it's, it's particular, but I think it may also be generalizable. This, uh, this, this uh, listener asks, what would you say to Afghan women who are being eliminated from history? And, and I would say there may be other, you know, other women of other, in other areas also being eliminated as we speak. Oh, that's, I mean, it's such a, huge and emotional question. I would say, hang on, hang on. All of the history that I've read says that the tide will turn, you will win, get as much education as you can, as safely as you can, keep it secret. You are in a time of terrible oppression and you have been absolutely betrayed by the people that you might look to help you. Um, so it's very, very, very dark at the moment but I am convinced that your country will only return to any sort of prosperity if your country learns to use the talent and the skills and the courage that you have. And, you know, I hope the tide turns sooner than later. And it, obviously it behoves all of us to, to, to give what support we can. Right. Thank you. Um... And now another listener is asking probably a little bit of a cynical question, um, saying you make such a brilliant point about historical works and how they do or do not represent women. And I think this person is referring you know, to the, the earlier pre-1950, pre-1970s works of history. And then this person asks, can we then trust histories, including academic texts? Oh, don't trust anything. <laughs> no, never, <laughs> never start from the assumption that anyone's telling you, you know, is 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 right. I mean, I think this is just you know history is history is just what is currently written by the people who currently think they've they've got across it. You know, I don't expect normal women to be the only the only book that does long form history of England. Probably by the year after next. I would hope it isn't. And I would expect that author to be full of, well, Philippa Gregory completely failed to do this or Philippa Gregory completely failed to. That's how good history has evolved. So you should read, or every history that you should read, you should read with the eye to the fact that the author is only human, is likely to make mistakes, that the author is profoundly biased. And when they say they're not, 
they've got that bias as well. They are so biased that they think they're not biased, which is the absolute measure of ignorance. So whenever you come across someone who says like, this is the, I've just written a play. Uh, sorry to go off on it. I've written a play Ooh. about, <laughs> I know, there is a reason to this. I've How written exciting. a play about Richard III, and he is in conversation with the character of history. And history comes on stage at the start of his journey and says, I am the completely unbiased authority on everything. <laughs> and literally, when history was first invented in the you know middle of the 19th century, people genuinely thought you could, you could produce a completely unbiased universal account which would explain everything because it's part of the whole enlightenment ambition which says everything can be explained we can learn everything we can know everything and now we've got ai and we go like yeah we can literally know everything and of course you only know what you're able to see at the time and you only see what you time because at the time because of your own blindness so none of us have the completely objective account of everything, uh, me included. So when you're reading history, never read one account. Read all the accounts you possibly have time to, to read and read them really critically because they will all have their own strengths and weaknesses. Oh, I think that's a really helpful answer. Um, and uh, there the, the, the are a couple of questions here. One is simply asking, was there a time period that proved to be the most difficult to research? Um, the least attractive to me was uh, coming into the modern time because uh, I kind of thought I knew about it and it was less of a less of an exciting journey of discovery. So I think, um, to be honest, uh, trade union history in the 1960s, hard going for me, not my cup of tea. I mean, I, I really like I really like certainly pre-World War I history. My, my, my instinct as to what, what to me seems history is really prior to the 20th century. So it was harder to do the modern stuff. And um, the hardest, I mean, I think for me, the hardest is the stuff I like the least. Um, but clearly, uh, the further you go back in time, the less records there are, the less material there is. But interestingly, the quality of the secondary history of what the historians are writing is really fantastically good. I I'm glad to hear that. Um, and now I'm thinking about what you're doing. Um, uh, there's, there's another question just coming in, which I'm trying to process, but I'll... I'll... <laughs> first ask the question that I've got in my head, which is- oh, You are multitasking oh, oh, like a- I'm, I'm trying, I'm yeah. trying. Um, what are, so what are you, you just mentioned that you're writing a play because I was about to ask, are you in the middle of another work of history or another novel? And now you've said you've just finished a play. So um, I guess you could tell us what you're in the middle of. It may be more than one thing. And how do you sort of decide what you're going to do next or what, what how do you, where are what you I'm now going, and what yeah, what I'm going to do next is is usually a bit of a scramble. The last year it's been a real scramble because um I've published Normal Women. I'm working on a adaptation of the book for children. So it will be accessible to children. So that's I mean that is a massive cutting process. It's got to be cut by two thirds. So you can imagine how anguish making that is. I started off thinking that I would just hand it over to an editor and let them cut it. And of course I couldn't couldn't resist um, putting my finger in that pie. So uh, that's given me a whole load of extra work, which I didn't really predict. Um, I had written some years ago, I had started writing a play about the life of Richard III and how his true life, his historical life, was so badly represented by Shakespeare's play, Richard III. And that developed over time into this, I love it, this very funny uh, dialogue between Richard III and history. History, the character is on stage almost throughout the whole play and uh, other people from Richard's life, largely women who were so influential in Richard's life and are not mentioned really by history by Shakespeare's history at all. Um, and so it's a, a, it's a, I finished it, I loved it. I was lucky enough that it was taken up by 
uh, Shakespeare North Playhouse, which is a little model. It, it's based on an Inigo Jones theatre, so it's a small theatre. It seats about 300 people uh, in outside Liverpool in England. And it's playing there right now. Um, it's on, for instance, it's on tonight. And it's oh. been wonderfully received and it's full houses most nights. And uh, it's transferring to Bury St Edmunds after Easter. And then I hope it will have another another life somewhere. If you know of a lovely little Shakespeare festival that would like to take it in the States, it would be lovely to see it go okay, somewhere else. Sure. But I'll, we I'll have very check with my check with my theatre friends. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, check yeah. with your theatre friends, especially if you have any rich theatre sponsors, that would be good. <laughs> um, so that's, I've been working on that also the, these months. And I'm about to start a new novel. I haven't been writing novels for more than a year. And it's extraordinary to me that I've been away that long and I can't wait to get back to fiction. I have a, I, I love writing fiction and I've got two or three novels and I could start any one of them. They're all a little bit started. So I could just I just have to choose which one to um, jump on. And then it's another journey. Do, w do you dare tell us which one, what, what it is about? Who's the main character or is this? No, not Still yet. Secret. There's literally there's there's three little nestlings in the nest, and one of them is going to fly, um, but I don't know which one yet. Oh my heavens, that's that's an exciting process. It really is. Um, it's thrilling. Yeah, yeah. Really so thrilling. so so there is a, a last question here. Um, the one question is, what kind of books do you read for fun? Mm -hmm. So that's a reader's, that's a listener's question. Um. I know I always sound so terribly draining. So a reviewer the other day called me a swatty girl, which is English abuse for a clever woman. Um, <laughs> mostly I read a lot of history. So I'm reading history at the moment. Um, if I'm ill and I need the comfort of a well-known novel, I will read probably, possibly if I'm very ill, I'll read Georgette Hare, the great historical fiction writer mm -hmm. of the previous century, um, who is sort of Jane Austen, but sexier and easier. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But she's a very great, she's a really, really good historical novelist. I read other historical, I read modern historical novelists now, which I didn't used to, but now I do. And for long car journeys, I listen to audiobooks. And my great love for a long car journey is uh, Dickens because mm. I've just started Nicholas Nickleby. I've got 30 hours of listening. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this is, this, is a, this is a discovery for me because I, I read the audio book of Normal Women myself and I'd never read uh, an audio book before and I didn't really, they didn't really enter my life. I didn't have a place for them in my life. And after I'd read my own, I went, this is so beautifully produced. There is so much work and effort and thought into like the music stings. You know, we had someone compose our own music for the change of chapters. And we had actors come in to do the voices of the women involved in riots and the women involved in the suffrage campaign. And I went, this is, I had no idea that it was so beautifully produced. And so, of course, I listened to my own and I went like, I love this form. And then I went, ideal because my work is now taking me all around the country. I'm not able to sit at home in my study as I used to do. So I put on an audio book now, and at the moment it's Dickens. Oh, that's terrific. Uh, now, so you, I was just listening to your podcast, or bits of your podcast this morning, So, and I love the actors and, and the voices and the music. It's terrific. Um, how many hours is the audio version of this book, which is what, seven, 657 pages or something? I think it's I think it's more than 20. I mean, it's okay. it's, you know, if, if if you're if you're an insomniac, I have a very soothing voice. <laughs> you, just, you just tuck it under your pillow and have it for that. But, um, you know, it's 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 a big book. It couldn't have yeah. been any shorter. It was agony to, to get it down to the length it is. When I was writing it, we even had a moment where we went, shall we go two volumes and mm -hmm. and let it be let it go large and I really didn't want I really didn't want two volumes because I think that's a big buy and what I wanted is I wanted it to be as available to as many people as possible especially 
women students, especially younger women students, and especially women who wouldn't normally buy a history book or wouldn't think they could afford a history book. So at the moment it's in hardback and with glossy pictures and it's a beautiful book for a library. But there is a, a paperback edition coming which is deliberately priced uh, so that people can afford to buy it. Yeah, that's terrific because I think it is a story that, that so many people will want to, to want to pick up and, and kind of immerse themselves in. Um, well, it, it's our story. I mean, it's, yeah. it's literally, it is the history of women. I, I You know, it's uh, what I would like to see in the future in my dream would be for each country to produce their own normal women of their own history. But certainly, you know, the the history of American women starts in 10, well, before, but you can read back your own history to 1066 England perfectly mm -hmm. easily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. And I think our uh, moderator is going to jump back in. And I hope she's also, you've, she sent the link to where they can buy the book through the local bookstore yeah. several times, I think. <laughs> oh. I put the link in the chat if you'd like to um, purchase this book. I will say as someone who listened to it on audio, it's about 27 hours and it was absolutely delightful to listen to. The musical interludes in between the voice actors, it felt theatrical. Um, Thank you. I'm glad of that. <laughs> I could not stop, and I'm pretty sure my next door neighbors have been hearing it. <laughs> oh, well, that's good. Them. Broadcast it. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. They're yeah. getting an accidental secondhand knowledge. <laughs> um, but I want to say if we'd love to have you, um, thank you so much for joining us. Again, the link to purchase the book, Normal Women, is in the chat. It's one of my favorite ones I've read this year. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating to have both of you and thank you so much. And I hope you have a lovely afternoon slash evening for you. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Nice to meet you. Thank it's you. A all pleasure to speak with you. Yeah. We hope to have you back soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.